Chancellor, Engineer Professor Sasse Faraday Oromese, Fellow Nigerian Society of Engineers, other principal officers of the university, Provost Deans and Directors, Emerita Professors, Visiting Vice Chancellors from Sisters Institutions, your Royal Highnesses, Top Government Functionaries, Staff and Students, Invited Guests, Gentlemen of the Press, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome every one of you to today's inaugural lecture. This is the 195th in the inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin to be delivered by Professor George Gadawo Eriyamrim. Topic, is it a myth or a shift in culture, the environment as a judge? May I humbly invite the Registrar OA Oshudi Mrs. to be introduced the Vice Chancellor and members of the Vice Chancellor's procession, the Registrar. Invitees, you are all welcome to the 195th inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin. Please permit me to stand on the existing protocol already observed by the University PRO. It's my rare privilege and honor to introduce the Vice Chancellor's entourage, which is led by the Vice Chancellor himself, Professor FFO Orumesi. the Vice Chancellor's entourage are the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Professor J. O. Egyorobu. We also have the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor P. E. Irowogwe. We have representing the Bossa. Mr. Ewagaru. Uh, we have the University Librarian, Dr. Mrs. Evelyn Omolua. Others on the on the other side of the days, we have provost deans and directors. We have the newly elected provost of the College of Medical Sciences, Professor E. Obiasu. We have the Dean School of Postgraduate Studies, Professor Victor E. Omozua. We have the Dean of Students, Professor O. B. Osadolo. We have the host Dean, Faculty of Life Sciences, Professor Mrs. O. I. in Abu Dhabi. We have the Dean, Faculty of Agriculture, Professor M. A. Bamikoli. We have representing the Dean, Faculty of Arts, Dr. E. B. Adeleke. We have the Dean School of Basic Medical Sciences, Professor Mrs. H. A. Oppo. We have the Dean Faculty of Engineering, Professor K. Obahiaki. We have the Dean Faculty of Law, Professor N. Inegbetion. We have representing the Dean Faculty of Management Sciences, Dr. A. E. Tafamil. We have the Dean School of Medicine, Professor M. I. Momo. We have representing the Dean Faculty of Pharmacy, Professor Ray Ozolua. We have the Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor D. E. Oriaki. We also have directors. We have director, general studies, Professor J. A. Akwapi. We 
have Director CROP UICT, Professor F. O. Ehaise. Director Center for Gender Studies, Professor Mrs. E. U. Edosoma. We have the Acting Director, Institute of Child Health, Dr. D. Mwaneri. We have Director Center for Part-Time Programs, Professor Mrs. K. A. Irakuna. We have Director IPAES, Professor S. O. IPAE. We have Director Distant Learning Program, Professor L. E. O. Omoruyi. We have Director Center for Entrepreneurship Development, Professor A. E. Uwubame. We also have Acting Director, Institute of Education, Professor D. Omorope. It is now my pleasure to call on the Vice Chancellor to introduce the lecturer of the day. The Vice Chancellor. Good evening, everybody. I would like to welcome you all. Also, I would like to stand on the existing protocol. I warmly welcome you all to the 195th of the inaugural lecture series of University of Benin. The 48th to be delivered in my tenure I divide the best of the name. The 15th lecture to be delivered in the Faculty of Life Sciences. And the 5th in the Department of Chemistry. As part of my routine update on activities on the University of Benin, I'm glad to, to report that in 2016-2017, Second semester examinations are ongoing smoothly in the schools, faculties, and institutes. I want to use this opportunity to solicit for the cooperation of all stakeholders to ensure the successful conclusion of the session. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our lecturer, Professor. George, Edo, 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 <laughs> Professor George Edago, Era Yeremu, Era Yeremu, was born in the city on the 19th day of April 1964 to Sir Chief Brothers Patrick Era Yeremu and Madame Elizabeth Ejewa Era Yeremu. Boat from Opara Inland in the East Government Area of Data State. After completing his primary school education at Victory Primary School University, he proceeded to Ovu Grammar School, Ovu Inland in Ethiop Local Government Area of Data State. At the completion of his secondary school education, he attended St. Patrick's College, Asaba for his advanced level certificate. He gained admission to the University of Edinburgh, where he obtained a BSc or chemistry degree in 1985. On completion of the mandatory NYC in 1986, Professor George proceeded to the University of Benin, 
where he obtained a MSc degree in biochemistry in 1988. He took up appointment with the University of Benin as an assistant lecturer in 1990 and a PhD degree in biochemistry in 1993. I rose to the ranks to the position of a full professor in 2007. His area of specialization is nutrition and toxicology. Professor Eri Yaremo is the current deputy vice chancellor at Kawa Campus, University of Guinea. I was the dean of students in the year 2011. Has several administrative positions, has served as chairman or a uh, member in, in several committees and boards within and outside the university, such as Faculty of Science Rep, University, University of uh, the UAB, 2000 to 2003, member post UTME and direct entry screening committee, 2005 to 2010, member. Screening Committee 2006 2008 Acting Director, General Studies, University of Benin, 2007 to 2009. Senior Committee on Sports, 2010 to 2014. Member, Council Committee on Appointment and Promotion, Junior Staff, 2011 to 2013. Member, Junior Staff Screening Committee, 2011 to 2013. Head of the Biochemistry in 2016. Professor George has taught and supervised many undergraduate and postgraduate students and has served as external examiner and assessor to several universities and professional bodies. He has attended several local and international conferences, seminars, and workshops within and outside Nigeria to present papers or attend training programs. To his credit, he has contributed to the development of knowledge with over 70 scholarly publications in both local and international books, chapters, and conference proceedings. He has served as a member of the editorial board of several journals and a reviewer of articles for publication in the field of nutrition and toxicology. Professor Eri Yaremo is a member of several professional bodies and has served as the National Secretary of the Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology from, from, from the year 1999 to 2003. He is happily married to Professor, to Pastor Mrs. Hannah Eri Yaremo and the idea of the best with three children. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor to invite Professor George Edawawo Eri Yarewa.
Dean of Students, sorry, Provost of the College of Medicine, Dean of the School of College of Students, Dean of Faculties, Dean of Student Affairs, Directors of Clinics, Professors and Members of Senate, Heads of Department, Members of the Teaching and Non-Teaching Staff, my Lord Spiritual and Temporal, Members of the Great University of Benin Alumni Association, Members of my Nuclear and Extended Family, Invited Guests, Students here present, all clergymen present, members of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I must say that I'm indeed very glad to be able to present this 195th inaugural lecture, which is a fifth from the Department of Biochemistry. The other four that we have presented represented by my teachers, one of whom is here. And uh, it is a singular pleasure for me to be able to present the fifth inaugural lecture. And <laughs> therefore, you have to say that if you are trying to fill the shoes of your teacher, it is an uphill task. So it was difficult for me to arrive at a title that we aptly um, uh, comprehend my research uh, experiences so far. So it was spoiled after all. In fact, I had to engage uh, a friend of mine in the Department of uh, uh, Religion and Philosophy. Now, uh, Department of Philosophy. In fact, he, he, test, he sent me through a test, a title which I, I got so confused about. I said, no, this one won't work. <laughs> Eventually settled for this title, and when my wife asked me, what's the title of your of your, set, of your inaugural lecture? When I told him, he said, wow, and there is George inside the thing. I said, yes, that's why. <laughs> now, the title is, is it a myth or a shift in culture, the environment as a job? Now, from the advanced Oxford and the advanced learners literature, a myth is something that people believe, but which does not exist. Uh, I grew up believing that our grandparents, the ones we call forebearers, that they lived for over 100 years, and sometimes we even hear that some of us lived over 120, 150 years. It was commonplace. But nowadays, it is not as common as I was when, uh, as at the time I was young. So, the tale about living for as long as 150 years, is it a myth? Did it really happen? Or it was a make believe? But having come to this age, I know at least of the mother of our vice chancellor who translated at 94. And our past vice chancellor who translated at 94. So I said to myself, this may not eventually be a myth. But anyhow, the life expectancy that they have now shows that life expectancy is increasing. So is it a myth? Or is it the, the tale of those people who survive? Now, uh, we know that in those days, as I was told, my father is here, told me that, that uh, the, that they ate fresh foods. And of course, it stands to reason, because they, 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 you know, there were no refrigerators there. So the foods, of course, must be fresh. And the foods were unrefined. But nowadays, uh, I have a situation in my home, I'm sure in most homes, where my wife will go to the market once a week and prepare meals that we cover for, uh, <laughs> for as long as we can. And we'll be praying that there's light. Once Nepal goes off, we are worried because we, are, we know that the food will soon go back. So, we, do not, we no longer eat fresh foods. We eat refrigerated foods. Of course, those days there was no, there was no refrigerated foods. So, are we really in a period where we are reducing the life expectancy? So that's why I asked, is this a myth? Now, uh, we seem to be going Western. Refrigerators came from the West. Many other things came from the West. We were told that knowledge started from the East and spread to the West. Fine. If we are not eating refined foods, is that good for us? That's the question. Is that good for us? And some of us, we hear that rich people, they always eat uh, refined foods. I hear of 
breakfast of uh, uh, this kind of beans they call uh, baked beans. Why those of us who are trying to be pretending to be rich, uh, we even were even worse off because uh, it is more difficult to wake somebody who is pretending to be sleeping than somebody who is sleeping. <laughs> Some of us are eating a while. And there is. Yes, it is a pastime sometimes to go and take hamburger. We take crab burger. And of course, if you don't know what crab burger is, if you squeeze bread, and uh, 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 akaraito bread, that's crab burger. <laughs> so, why do we need to settle for hamburger? Now, some of us, when we receive our pocket change, we go out, we want to pretend as if we are big, particularly when we receive our salaries. We want to eat shawarma. I don't know where shawarma, shawarma came from, but those of us who, who are a little more at home, we would rather go for bobozi. And, and it's cheaper. Those foods are not refined. So, do we have a drinking culture? Are we moving away from our traditional meals into such meals? Now, is it possible? That is because the environment that we have has been damaged because of industrialization or environmental pollution that they have forced into such meals? That is the question. Therefore, in this lecture, I will attempt to summarize the research experience and I will leave you to be the judge whether what we have now is actually a win or a shift in culture. Now, I would like to divide this lecture into three parts. The first part, which is before I earn a PhD. Then the second part, which is after I earn a PhD, up to about now. And the third part, when I started collaborating with other friends, believing that science knowledge is not local. Now let us begin this lecture by looking at what digestibility is. Digestibility of food simply means digestion and absorption of food. How is food made available? It has to be digested, then you have to absorb it. Now, I'd like to play a table, uh, sorry, a, a, a bar chart, where we have protein biological values. The first one there is for whites, egg whites. Egg white is entirely protein. The next one is uh, the one we call nama. Uh, nama, eh? And chicken. <laughs> then we have, we have bran, we have rice. The value for rice is 70%. But that value is for unprocessed rice. I doubt if many of us eat unprocessed rice. But we thank uh, the federal government of Nigeria, who is attempting or has put some laws in place to try and make Nigerians move away from our foreign Polish rice to our locally uh, generated rice. Now, even if you were to eat um, uh, egg, egg white, which is entirely protein, you cannot absorb all of the egg white. Even when you digest it, some of it is lost and it will come out as pieces. Um, what you call shit. <laughs> <laughs> but allow me to show you a diagram which will attempt to look at digestion, where the major action takes place. And of course, take away, take away the mouth section. Now, the top one that looks like a big bowl ball is a representation of the liver. And very close to the liver is one small bag. That one is the bone bladder. Uh, yellow, you remember which time we, you kill chicken? They tell you don't say avoid the green. Eh? That green part is the bone bladder. Uh, they tell us don't bust the green, that will make the meat go sour. Eh? Uh, or bitter. Okay. But no, when I was killing chicken, I didn't bust that green. <laughs> now, that green is a store of what they call bile acids. Those bile acids, they help in food digestion, particularly digestion of fats. They will help to emulsify fats. Imagine that you put oil in water. They won't mix. But if you attempt to scatter the oil on the water, it will disperse the oil. If you have a soap there, the soap will keep them dispersed for as much as possible. That is what they call emulsification. So your bile acid 
the one that you have in that dream, eh, you know, is the one that contains the Bible that will help to disperse the fat. Now, when they are in that dispersed state, they are better digested. And the action for digestion is in the small intestine, which is represented by that small ball that goes that way, and then goes to the large intestine, and then um, you excrete. But just as food is entering the small intestine, you find that the, the, the gall will cause bar to be released into the small intestine. When they will mix with the oil, and there will be a multiplication. Sometimes you hear the lady make boo 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 boo. That is a multiplication going on. Now, then the enzymes will digest the fat. Some of the fat will be absorbed. It is not all of the fat that, has, uh, uh, that you take is that you ingest is uh, absorbed. Some of them is absorbed. Some of them is lost to the large intestine. In the large intestine, then they get converted by microorganisms that you have there, and they produce products that will make your feces or your sheet go brown. Now, if this is digestion, then food once taken must be digested and then absorbed. In those days, I dare to say those days, because my teacher is here, we believe that the major contributor to uh, things like stroke, things like atherosclerosis, things like hypertension, Cardiovascular disease, say it's cholesterol. But the world has since changed their view. But anyway, that time, the argument was there. If you went to the hospital, the doctor was interested in knowing what your fasting cholesterol level was. And the cholesterol of importance that is of concern to the medical doctors, there's one in the, in the business team, is the one they call LDL cholesterol. They tell it as bad cholesterol. Once you have high fasting level of LDL cholesterol, they say you should slow down. Don't eat fatty foods. Do a lot of exercise. And they, 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 they go on and on. Uh, in fact, they told us that egg is a major uh, contributor to blood cholesterol. I recall uh, Professor Charles Imari Gai when we were in the staff club drinking one time. He said, when we were small, if they catch you eating egg, they say that uh, you have blood drops. Uh, and now we are old, we can eat egg. They say, don't eat egg, it's going to contribute to your cholesterol. <laughs> so, so, someone wonders, when, is, when am I ever going to eat egg? <laughs> but thankfully, uh, the medical world is trying to remove cholesterol now as a, as a major cause for uh, high blood pressure. Anyway, in 1986, uh, I joined the Department of Biochemistry uh, as a student. And there was this debate in the department. Which one is a major contributor to blood cholesterol? Is it the fat that you consume or the fat that is available? Now, um, some people were in one end of the debate saying that it is the dietary fiber component that you have in food that is able to translate into affecting blood cholesterol. But there's another group that said no. The major contributor is the ability for the body to digest the fat. That argument went on. When we wanted to join the research team, I was able to join the research team of one Indian lady called uh, Professor Mrs. George. But before I tell that story, let us look at what the dietary fiber is. The dietary fiber, for sure, is any part of food you cannot digest. Once you cannot digest the food, it becomes dietary fiber. And the dietary fiber components of food include Cellulose, don't mind us in my chemistry, we like to tell people. Uh, that is why I'm not scared when I see uh, uh, Patrick Obayo. If, if he tells me, uh, Krikum Krakum, I will tell him, Glyco Obayo, Glyco. So we have a mutual respect for each other. So when, when you reach my side, I say, George, what is I don't need you <laughs> They include cellulose, hemicellulose, bran, lignin, pectin, bone, but you can bond. Class them broadly into two. The ones that are woody, you know, the ones that are soluble. The woody ones are the ones you find in green vegetables, uh, like uh, uh, bitter leaf, uh, water leaf, and all that. The ones that are soluble are the ones you find in things like okra or bono, the wedu, 
All those ones are the solid ones. Anyway, I was calling to this debate and I joined the digestibility group where we needed to know how much you can digest the fat and how much is absorbed. Now, this Indian lady had done a study earlier to show that the digestion of the fat is affected by the type of what we call triacid glycerols and um, uh, uh, fatty acids. Well, palm oil, even when commonly consumed in Nigeria, as at that time, we have not done the configuration of the triacid glycerol in palm oil. So I had the pleasure of working with this lady, and we were able to work out the triacid glycerol um, uh, component of palm oil and its fractures. We know that palm oil has two sections. There's the liquid section, there's also the uh, soluble section. The liver on ground, you will divide into two. Uh, the top one is the one they call liquid section, the bottom one is solid section. Now, both of them, they have different triacidal components. So they will have different digestibility coefficients. Anyway, we were able to work out that and we were able to publish the paper. Now, this lady, having completed that study, soon left uh, back to India. So, but I continued with the work, and I reasoned that, oh, of course, you don't go to the market, purchase only palm oil, come home and drink it. You have to use it to prepare meals, or prepare soup. And therefore, if you are going to prepare a soup with it, do you just take the soup, or you consume the soup with a bath, or a mara or something, or a pudding? So, we then said, no, let us now design a protocol that we look at the digestion of palm oil even when it is consumed with other companies. Now, we are able to formulate this table, and this table shows the, the ones we compounded. We had curry, we had fish oil, we had garlic oil, melon, and other companies. We were able to feed these feed to rats to measure their digestibility in the presence of those companies. Now, when I was doing this experiment, there was a friend of mine, uh, Peter Brackle, he's a barrister Peter Brackle, uh, he told me he was going to come attend this uh, ceremony. Vice Chancellor, when, during Christmas period, we, he came to visit me in the lab and told me, why are you working when people are busy believing? I said, well, I have to, I have to get, I have to get this data ready. He said, uh, what am I working on? I attempted to explain to him. I told him that I'm working on things that are related to hypertension. Ah, he said to me, now with the website, and let us go and get the pussy tax, show the rats, what the rats will develop hypertension. <laughs> I said, well, that is fine, but uh, I wish you were here. If we did that then, I'm sure we will we'll not be able to generate this table, this table that shows the influence of fiber on the digestibility of oils. We were able to show from that story that soluble fibers reduce cholesterol better than um, uh, non-soluble fibers. And that led, led us to the conclusion that, of course, uh, digestibility is affected by fiber. Now, uh, last week, my father called me and asked me, uh, wanted to know how much I was preparing. My father is here sitting. I will introduce him later. Well, I said I was going to present the inaugural lecture. This is as far as I've gone. He said, oh, thank you much. I said, Papa, you still remember? He said, yes. Uh, my father worked with uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, then as a typist, and then rose until he retired. He was the one who typed my MSc and PhD thesis. <laughs> well, thank you, Papa. So I said, I was going to talk about digestibility. When somebody mentioned dicarot, I was very excited. Uh, dicarot is ogono. We were able to measure the digestibility of the But at the end of that research, we were able to show that yes, fiber contributes to cholesterol. Also, the digestibility of the oil contributes to cholesterol. So, indeed, that debate that was going on in my department as to which one contributed to cholesterol level was indeed like a person seeing the number, seeing the number six from both ends. I would say this is the number six, looking at it from this end. And the other guy looking at it from the other end, who says it's the number nine. So they were up all about so saying the same thing. Anyway, we were able to publish these letters and these letters, and we moved on. Now, when uh, that Indian lady had left, and I got admitted 
with the help of Professor A.S. Iwanza into a PhD program. I approached one Professor Ishola Adams. Uh, that man was a consummate researcher. Uh, a very fine gentleman, fine father. In fact, he was like uh, one of our mentors uh, in the department. Always very well dressed. Professor Adamsi and Professor E.S. Wanze and Professor Osagi, they were in the same category of those who dressed most. When we were students, if we were to rank them, we would say, okay, this one, this one, myself, most of all, I'm already be busy in some evenings, say, who dressed fast today? <laughs> <laughs> the only person we saw there that was in their category was Professor Antonio Ebebe. Uh, very well dressed, very well dressed. Very well dressed. Excited to be able to approach him to uh, supervise my PhD. Uh, he said, Okay, fine. Then he just returned from America. He gave me what he called the Fiber News. A compendium of research that has been done over 10 years. They spanned the period of 1980 to 1989. He gave me those papers. I carefully read through them. They were 16 volumes. And my father then had a photocopier. Uh, I did what we call piracy. I started photocopying those. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I know that I have to come up with my chancellor. If uh, those uh, right people come now and say, oh God, they saved me, I did it. <laughs> anyway, by the time I had gone through those articles, my mind was made up that I was going to research into the role of diet in colon carcinogenesis. And I met him, he said, okay, fine. Luckily, then he just returned from America with a lot of chemicals. Say, okay, go on your research. So we we then embarked on research into colon carcinogenesis. But before I go into that, let me please go through this with you so that you can flow with me. Now, every cell has a function. The brain cell functions as a brain cell. A muscle cell functions as a muscle cell. If you take a muscle cell and put it in the kidney, it cannot function. And the body must fight it and kill it. And therefore, if a cell, every cell also has a function. If the cell is not doing what it should do, it is, it is killed. And that process is called apoptosis. Anyway, every cell has a cycle. There is a time to grow. They call it G phase. By chance, that, that G is for growth. Uh, there is an M phase. That one is for mitosis. Mitosis is cell division. And there is a time to synthesize DNA. They call it, what they call the S phase. Every cell goes through it. If a cell is not going through that, it must either be a nerve cell or a cell that is called a rogue cell. That rogue cell must be killed. But if that rogue cell becomes trapped between the mitotic and growth phase, it may generate a disease. And that disease is mostly cancer. That's a cell cell. Now let me take you through um, the large intestine. That's the one I call colorectal because my research was in colon carcinogenesis. Now, the rectum is also called the large intestine. When, uh, when we go and we take pepper soup, we say, give me assorted. Some of the assorted that you eat, some of them may just be <laughs> small or large intestine. Anyway, they are five essential parts of the uh, 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 colorectal. There's one they call the ascending colon, which is that one. The one they call transverse colon, which is the one that goes across. Then there's the descending colon. Then there's one they call the sigmoidal colon, and then the rectum and anus. That large intestine is the house of microorganisms. When you uh, when you call madam, when you call those men to come and push out the cow we got today, uh, was it today we killed it? Today, aha. Now we are going to be really careful now. <laughs> now those places they were packing shit from. That is the large intestine. It is an abode of microorganisms. The microorganisms there, they feed this colon. They feed it, and they also feed themselves. So the microorganisms are delighted to be able to receive undigested or unabsorbed food because they are going to brew with it. That is the large intestine. Now, what is carcinogenesis? Carcinogenesis is the process for leading from the conversion of a normal cell to the development of cancer. When a normal cell goes rogue and becomes cancerous and becomes cancer, we call that process carcinogenesis. Uh, like I told you, 
use big, big words. That carcinogenesis can be divided into three stages. There's the one they call the initiation stage. There's the one they call the promotion stage. And there's the one they call the progression stage. At progression, you already have cancer and you have what they call metastasis. You might find somebody who has breast cancer. At that stage, if you remove the breast, it makes no sense. Because the cells have become fluid, you may end up having limb cancer. Now, at the initiation stage, there's something that happens to the gene that will convert normal cell into an abnormal cell. At the promotion stage, that abnormal cell can be there. Nothing will happen. But if prompted with the right environment, that rogue cell, which is an abnormal cell, can then undergo what they call promotion and will then develop a tumor. That tumor can either be benign, to just be non life threatening to be there, or it may develop and progression into cancer. Now, let me summarize by this scheme. The one on top, the cell there used to be a normal cell, but that cell has undergone mutation and has now become an abnormal cell. That abnormal cell soon goes through uh, uh, promotion to, into a, to a tumor. That tumor may be benign or it may become cancerous. If it goes through progression, it becomes cancer. That is the one we call carcinogenesis. Don't mind me. These are, these are, these are the kind of things our doctors see every day. Uh, this part is the small intestine. Every other part here is the large intestine. Now, you will find in that large intestine you can find polyps, which are tumor stage um, uh, um, uh, stages of carcinogenesis. Or you can have the ones that have gone through progression and you now have cancer. That is the diagnostic representation. Now let's just talk about diet. Because my work was really on the role of diet in um, carcinogenesis, colon carcinogenesis. Now, it is said that it is, you are what you eat. Whatever you eat will determine you. Uh, save for some people. I know of a friend of mine who can eat all the food we have in Benin. He is still as thin as possible. Uh, but if I take half of what he consumes, uh, my vice chancellor will be asking me questions. George, where are you coming from? <laughs> anyway, when you eat, eventually you are going to lose some of the food which is not digested to the large intestine. And the microorganisms are there waiting for it. The type of food you eat will determine the type of microorganisms you have in the large intestine. In fact, the clear evidence of whether or not what you take in affects the large intestine, try drinking stout. If you drink stout, you will see the color of your sheets. Those of us who drink stout, I drink red wine. My wife is always the same. <laughs> I don't know how it is like if you drink malt. But anyway, it will affect the color. And therefore, whatever you take will affect the bacteria that you have in the large intestine. And the total bacteria that you have in your body is called your body microbiome. Now, your microflora, which is the microorganism and the digest from digested food with large intestine, will determine what will happen there. Now, in Nigeria, we consume mostly foods that emphasize carbohydrates, with less of protein and less of fat. Our diet is usually low in calories, and we also consume that our diet with a lot of fiber. Uh, I can imagine an Igbo man eating a soup that does not contain vegetable. You can tell you say this food is naked. <laughs> because there's no vegetable. Uh, and one of some of the best soups that we have in Nigeria are the ones that come with very spicy vegetables. Think about um, uh, buffalo wine. Just think about it. Think about your egusi. Imagine you cook a egusi soup, no vegetable, no leaf. Get us a deal. <laughs> so in general, those of us who consume carbohydrates, we are likely going to have a different microflora as compared to those who consume more protein. In fact, uh, when, uh, when you go to the restaurants in Nigeria and you are asking to eat food, you say, what do you want? Say swallow or rice. Those are the two options you have. Uh, if you say 
rice is carbohydrates. If you say swallow, they say which type? You say amala, or pandelia, or eba. It is all carbohydrates. It is only after you have defined your food with the carbohydrate you want, the, the person will ask you which kind you want on top. So the protein becomes secondary. You go, okay, give me uh, bush meat, or give me. But I've, I've gone to the book one day, my vice chancellor, then I was uh, in Australia. There was this guy who bought soup, a bar, and bought yam as meat. <laughs> what he was eating, he reports the yam as if he's eating meat. <laughs> so I called, I called one of the waitress, I said, Abe, give that guy meat. <laughs> because this water system don't work. <laughs> You remember Bosset those days? Bosset would come to your tray. Say, I bet, who be a widow? Who be a bar? Who be familiar? As if we are. So, when you go and demand for a bar, a mala, or starch, what we call a seed, the white man defines his own diet with the protein. The white man will say, Give me fish, give me ham, give me steak, all those are protein. It is only after then they define the Carbohydrates. I will have some fries with it. Fries, let me pick a little bit. Where is God? When I was in the boarding house, if you still had curry at meat and bread, you are a global master. Your corner is like Mecca. Everybody is trooping there because curry is also called students' stadium. It is all so bad that even our meat pie, the one we call meat pie, is now laced with potato. The price of meat pie is actually potato pie. <laughs> so we actually eat more of carbohydrate, fiber, but they are low in calories. Very important, they are low in calories. While the people in the West will be eating a lot of protein and their company fat, which is high in calories. Now, what is the origin of colon cancer? Uh, before 1992, it was believed that colon cancer originated mostly from diet. But it was in 1992 that Powell and his colleagues, they were able to fashion out an experiment that determined that it's not, it's a gene, they call ABC gene. Uh, Papa, not the ABC that you used to give us when we were sick. Uh, that one, uh, aspirin, paradox, and codeine. This one is the adenomatous polyposis coli. <laughs> if Obaya were here now, if you just tell me triple crackle, I will tell him, Adenomatous polyposis coli. That is the ABC gene. That is the one that results. If you lack that gene, then you are likely going to have colon cancer. It is only a few cases that are diet originated. Now, like I said earlier, you will have a normal cell that will translate into the one that can form a tumor and eventually lead to cancer. But the important thing is that there is a lack. The APC gene. The APC gene is a tumor suppressor. So when a cell has translated into one that is supposed to be cancerous, if you have the APC gene, it will suppress it. So it will never generate a tumor. Now let us look at the epidemiology of uh, colon cancer. Now, studies have shown, like Green in 2001, that people living in, in the United States and Europe, and even in Australia, that the cases of colon cancer that you have there is high, but Buckins, which is the father of that study, in 1971, noticed that in the black people in South Africa, when they eat a lot of carbohydrate and fiber, the cases of colon cancer is low as compared to the white counterparts. Walker, in 1985, also found a similar um, um, result. Now, Many other things have been said about diet and cancer, but one that is interesting is the one that comes from immigration studies, where they show that people that immigrated from other countries where the cases of colon cancer was low, and they went to places where the colon cancer was high, they eventually, in the second generation, started having cases of colon cancer that are comparable to the people that were there originally. Chinese people that left China, when they got to America, after their second generation, those their children started having cases of colon cancer as those people in America. Similar cases were found with the Japanese, 
and the Jews, and even in the Philippines. And this led to believing that time must have a role to play in colon cancer. We also had experimental studies that looked at the role of diet in colon cancer. Some of these studies, they are numerous. People like Krzyzewski, Ruggeri, Rao, Reddy, they all published over a thousand papers on the role of colon cancer, on the role of diet in colon cancer. So you see those people, they were looking at the late stages of cancer, when cancer had developed. And my supervisor then, from Saddam's, just returned from America. And he reasoned with me, he said, oh boy, let us now study colon carcinogenesis from initiation. Let us leave progression, let us leave uh, promotion, let us leave progression. So let us study the things that will happen from the onset that can generate colon cancer. So we said, okay, fine. If we're going to do that, with my experience using digestibility, I said, well, let us formulate diet that is whole. Let us not use semi-purified diets, that, as we have it in Ugo people. So we then formulated diets for the study of heart cancer. This is the diet we formulated. Um, we had curry, we have soya bean, we have palm oil. And the important thing is the quantity of the things that you're taking. You find that in the Nigerian diet, carbohydrate is high, fiber is high. That's one of the first cellulose, it's high. But in the American diet, it's low. And the one in the, uh, the protein is also low. We couldn't use the casein or milk that they drink in Oyibo land. Because it will be very possible. So we set up for Gary, but we just reduce the quantity of Gary. If I probably sent out this paper for publication, uh, the white man asked us what was Gary. Initially, when I wrote up the thing, I just left it as Gary, not knowing that uh, white man said, don't even know what to call Gary. <laughs> anyway, we try to look at what influence this our Nigerian diet will have on the microflora, the, those microorganisms that you have in the large intestine. We also try to look at what the Western type diet will have on the microflora. Whether a shift from the Nigerian diet will have any role to play in those and we look at enzymes that are connected to the development of colon cancer. Now, um, uh, we also assessed whether our Nigerian type diet will contribute calcium. Calcium ions is able to suppress colon cancer as against which one we contribute more, whether it's the Nigerian diet or the Western diet. And what effect do they have on the microflora? We also study the effect of folic acid which is a big class vitamin. We study the effect it have on cellular process in colon. We also study the effect vitaline we have on colon cancer. In all these aspects of our research, which went after my PhD, we were able to establish that a Nigerian type diet is likely better to protect against the development of colon cancer as against a Western type diet. Now, to confess this, thank you. Now, to confess this, it was not enough to look at just the microflora. We needed, we needed to know what was happening in the colon itself. We looked at, we studied the colon mucosa, the colonic mucosa, we also studied the, the colonic tissue. And some of the things we examined were related to energy generation, they were related to free radical generation, also lipids, those are the ones that have membranes. I had to run into some proteins. Don't mind me. Those, those are just names of enzymes. You know, those are, um, if you want to build a house, you need cement. The cement cannot be dry. If you bring dry cement, unless nowadays this one they put them, uh, they say they put brick to brick, I see them all the time. Anyway, for a cell to grow, the ground substance which holds cells together must be liquefied. It must become liquid so that the cell can become, can be free of rigidity and will then. I will then throw. Thank you. Is my son sleeping? Yeah, why are you sleeping? <laughs> are you hungry? <laughs> uh, okay, fine. No, no, we'll soon be there. We'll soon be there. Hmm? I know you are looking forward to the party, right? <laughs> now, so we also studied the exchanges between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. We studied oxygen consumption in the cells and the survival center. Allow me to provide. Some of the findings we made, we were able to demonstrate that the Nigerian diet will discourage 
glycolysis or aerobic glycolysis by suppressing the enzyme they call phosphofructokinase, where is Patrick Obayago? <laughs> if he were here, he tells me anything and we tell him phosphofructokinase. <laughs> that enzyme is the key enzyme in glycolysis. We were able to find that in Nigerian diet, where even when rich in glucose, um, carbohydrates or fiber, is able to cause the colon to suppress the utilization of glucose. But the Western diet will improve it. And that is the typical nature of a cancerous cell. Whether you take oxygen or not, cancerous cell is using energy, but it needs to grow. We found that the Western diet will, will promote carcinogenesis. We also looked at the pentose of cell pathway. That pathway provides the precursor that you need to form nucleotides. Nucleotides are the building blocks of what you call nucleic acids or your DNA. If you don't have nucleotides, you can't form DNA. We found that the Nigerian diet will suppress the formation of nucleotides as against the Western type diet. Now we found that in the colon there is no generation of free radicals. When you produce free radicals, those free radicals can offend the cell and you have a myriad of problems. Not only cancer, most of the diseases that you have now, they have a link, direct link or an indirect link to free radicals. We found that the Nigerian diet is able to suppress the generation of free radicals. It's also able to boost itself in producing enzymes that can kill or fight against free radicals. In all, uh, my vice chancellor, I'll try and make this speedy so that my boy don't. There the guy. He's <laughs> gone for that, that exercise, eh? Okay. Um, we found that Vitali is able to mitigate against oxidative stress, and at the end of the day, we were able to conclude that the Nigerian diet actually can suppress the generation of colon cancer. Now, we have produced, just as I was produced, I've also produced a PhD on this research. Uh, when I come to the Antarctic, I will, I will tell Professor Wanz that the role he played in some of these things because they may be a struck to him now. Now, when we looked at it, we said, fine, if eating our Nigerian diet is going to be able to protect against diseases or some diseases, why are we then eating imported foods? Is it because we no longer grow our foods? In fact, uh, uh, if you were to ask me, I would say, yes, because as a small boy, we had gardens. But now, our area has been taken over by pollution. Pollution from food oil, or pollution from the spirits of food oil. Anyway, toxicology is from Greek word, which means to study poisons, to poison the cell. And closely related to toxicology is toxicity. And toxicity has a direct link to the quantity given and the form it's given. My research centered on crude oil and some of the accompanying heavy metals like cadmium, like lead. We, if you have crude oil spill in the site, it, it, is, it is possible that you may have rain, and the rain will then wash up the crude, you will have runoff water, so you will have the crude oil uh, fractionated into those ones that are soluble in the water, and those ones that are not soluble in the water. So we studied all these things, and we studied it in both animals and plants, because when you have crude oil spill, the crude oil spill is not going to select an animal from the plant. As it's poisoning the animal, it's also poisoning the plant. So we studied um, uh, these conditions in both animals and plants. Root um, uh, cadmium uh, is mostly from water, from food, and you know what? Also from cigarette smoke. So if you smoke a lot of cigarettes, the chances are that you'll be more exposed to cadmium. <laughs> So when we get to the staff club later, when I see some people smoking, instead of, I'll, just, I'll just say, cadmium, you, I'll walk away. <laughs> they know what I'm talking about. So my chance was, we did studies in animals. And what do we follow? We tried to look at the pattern of accumulation of cadmium when we administered them with drinking water and fed them in Nigerian diet. We to, tried to look at cadmium effect on digestion of proteins, on liver function, on eye, on brain, and whether vitamin E can offer protection to cadmium, whether crude oil can 
affect stress patterns in fat folks. We looked at biochemical changes in headworms exposed to cancer. Now, what we found in all of these studies is very, very interesting. Now, if you recall, I told you that the Nigerian diet will likely protect against colon cancer development. But when we looked at it in cadmium toxicity, we found that yes, the Nigerian diet will not allow cadmium to be absorbed. But it will cause the most stress, uh, oxidative stress. And this posed a lot of questions for us. And so we started looking at other things. We looked at the effect it has uh, on, on um, activation of metals of dark cadmium in organs. Uh, the Nigerian diet caused oxidative stress. Uh, we found that the effect on toxicant is dose dependent. Uh, we observed that the toxicant is general cause reduction in weight of the animals. They affected the liver. They were able to reduce digestive enzymes, uh, which reduces the absorption of uh, the potent effects. We found that vitamin E, which is a antioxidant vitamin, was able to protect rats against carbon toxicity by improving what we call membrane fluidity. Uh, palm oil. Palm oil contains beta carotene. In fact, the red color of palm oil is because of beta carotene content. So our mothers, those of us who like to bleach our oil before we use it to cook, please stop it. Because bleaching of the oil will reduce the quantity of beta carotene that we have there. And beta carotene is the precursor of what the vitamin is called vitamin A. Vitamin A requires for good eyesight. And we found that palm oil can protect the eye, uh, tissues like cornea, lens, and retina from toxicity. Uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that if you have pollution, eh, it's likely going to affect waters and terrestrial beings. And we know that the price of river fish is gone up. Ah, here, uh, Yoma, you also went out to uh, where you sleep in. <laughs> we found that now you will have to go and book for river fish. They say every Wednesday is river market. That's when you go and collect river fish. But if we wait for river fish, that will be spotted. So we now grow the, some of our fish in the, the ponds. The popular one is the one they call the African catfish or glass cherubinus. Uh, if you never see that before, that one without right? that is, that's the diagram of catfish. How many of us like that? We are going to eat some today even. <laughs> now, we looked at how this fish can accumulate the metal before carbon. And we found that, yes indeed, it accumulates metals, is even more in the gills and kidney. And when we kill that fish, we slip it and take away the uh, bongo. That's the bongo, that's where you remove the liver, kidney and all that. But we don't wash the gill thoroughly. And the gill concentrates uh, carbon. So, uh, but thankfully, when I eat, uh, African catfish in my house. I know it's totally clean, but I cannot vouch when you take it in the restaurant. So that's why I completely now avoid the head of that fish. So I say, which one you want? I say, give me the center. <laughs> <laughs> now, we also carried out these toxicant studies in plants. Our major plants that we studied was beans and maize. One being a monocotyledon, one a dicotyledon. One a leguminous plant, one a, 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 with fibrous and a, roots. Anyway, what do we study in these plants? We, okay, before we go into that, I recall that we had a fifth study where we wanted to know the quantity of cadmium and lead in some of the vegetables that we consume. We looked at uh, bitter leaf, spinach, uh, pumpkin leaf, and uh, uh, what they call lugu. And we went to sites that we believe that were uh, contaminated. We looked at a palm, uh, a palm fly. What is the Kalila Sami? Now, a palm uh, is a highly industrial area, a highly populated area. We took all these plants from a palm, we went to Focados, we took the plants, we went to Alaja, we also took the plants. And we wanted to know the quantity of carbon and lead in those, uh, in those vegetables. Thankfully, the quantity of the metals that we found in the vegetables were within safe range, except for a pan. <laughs> so if you want to worry, please, I'll, I'll try as much as possible. If you can, <laughs> if you can, uh, we're good here. Uh, we're we'll able to publish that later. <laughs> now, we studied other things in plants. We looked at germination, we looked at markers of stress, anti-stress enzymes, enzymes responsible for transport of minerals, 
level of starch, membrane phospholipid, vitamin C production, and mineral uptake by roots. In all the cases, we found that germination of the plant seedlings was fused by toxicants. We also found that the heavy metal and crude oil fractions increased stress for plants. Uh, the toxicants also increase, the, decrease sorry, the activity of proteases. Proteases are enzymes that can digest proteins. If you reduce the activity, it means you cannot digest the protein, and therefore food mobilization may be difficult. We also found that the uh, roots of uh, uh, there, there was decrease in oxygen consumption, the transport of minerals was affected, chlorophyll content was decreased, um, starch production was decreased, the plant was not able to effectively synthesize vitamin C, vitamin C is an antioxidant, antioxidant vitamin, mineral, uh, mineral uptake was hindered, uh, there was a switch from, um, uh, uh, to anaerobic, uh, anaerobic energy production. What I mean by that, instead of burning glucose completely to carbon dioxide and water, to burn it halfway, so you get less energy. We found that maize adapted better to than beans to the conditions. We also studied this in the Beji River. Beji was a site that was filled with crude oil and the cleanup process was very slow. So we went to Beji, uh, Dr. Stella Olubodu, who is now the uh, Vice Chancellor of the HOD of uh, Medical Biochemistry, uh, was able to undertake that study. Now, this is a plate showing what we had in our control, uh, very rich, the roots. But look at when you put crude oil, devoid of all those things that can affect um, uh, speciation. Recall that last two weeks we had from Professor Okobodo, the rhizosphere, and the effect of low roots. Now the roots were adversely affected. We found that also in all the other cases we studied. Now, when we compare the beige to 10% contamination with water in some fraction, they look alike. So, of course, it was also manifest with uh, maize. In all of this research, I was able to produce 30 uh, student, uh, graduate students in the master's and MP programs. We produced four PhD students. Uh, Our laboratory at one time or the other was led by different uh, champions in our laboratory. Um, at one time, Bobby Agweba Ogie was leading the team, uh, Kenneth Atoya was leading the team, Ochukololodi, who is currently completing his PhD program uh, abroad, also led the team. Currently, we have Chide uh, Duweze as well as Grace. Uh, uh, let me not run the risk. I wanted to call her Munamure. I think, but well, she's married now. I don't know which. <laughs> anyway, we also had Zezi, who, and then Georgina Irifeta carried out our uh, Edmund studies. Augusta Idegwejong carried out our um, uh, studies in cancer and vitaliv at the early stages of uh, carcinogenesis. In all my research work, I had collaborated with my colleagues. I believe that collaborative study, in collaborative study, we have to engage ideas. And we were able to produce 76 papers that have been published in national and international journals. Please, I will encourage you to please purchase a pamphlet because I've just given you an, an abridged such a version of what is contained in that book. It may make for good, for good reading. <laughs> now, I'd like to acknowledge the following. <laughs> this is the most important part because <laughs> I run the risk of not mentioning one or two names. <laughs> but straight away, I will acknowledge the hand of God in my life that has protected me by. <laughs> When I look back to the ways I've gone through in life, I say to myself, our Almighty God is truly the great architect of the I'm grateful to our Vice Chancellor, Professor F.F.O. Oroesi. 
a man of quiet men, a man of disciplined politics, a man of peace. God has used him to remove reproach. <laughs> I'm also thankful to the wife of our vice chancellor, my special friend, my brother. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm truly indebted to your family. Truly, truly indebted. I would like to thank uh, our Royal Highness, Omono Banedo, Ukwa Kolokolo, Oba Ewae II, the mother of the women. He has impacted so much in my life, and I will ever remain grateful. Uh, he's the father of all, he's reigned, he longs, he feels with hope and justice for all. Oba Atoko Ewae. <laughs> now, I'm thankful to Professor O.G. Oshodi, who is immediate past vice chancellor. Um, it was him who announced my professorship. Um, we were on our way to, we were on our way to Lagos to witness the marriage of my brother. When in Lagos, somebody called me and said, George, they don't answer, they don't answer. I said, eh, hey, hey. eh. I told the cabman to please wait. I said, wait, 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 I'm the professor, wait. <laughs> and if I, if I had a complete place to stop, I came down uh, my, with my friend, we knelt down, raised my hands to the uh, high levels, and thanked God Almighty. I also prayed for the family, for the family of Ocean. I'm grateful for you. appoint me as uh, announce my promotion. He also appointed me as Dean of Students. I'm thankful. <laughs> now to my special one. Professor B. A. C.
Now, Prof. Owen once did not stop here. With Providence, he became vice chancellor in this university between 2004 and 2009. And when he became vice chancellor, uh, he settled down all right. He appointed me then as a special member of Senex. That has been scrapped now. <laughs> but uh, I went to him one evening. I said to myself, the best time to see him is to go in with him. I went to him, I told him, I said, now, Prof, every other person above me, because I'm the ninth professor in the department, every other person I've gone on sabbatical, I want to proceed on sabbatical. He laughed, and I said, George, please sit down. You are going nowhere. <laughs> I'm going to make you director of GS. Don't you want that? I said, ah, with a push you up and the hospital. <laughs> I got appointed as the director of general studies. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we found ourselves into what we call the fifth dimension. When things were going wrong in the university, we were in the shadows. We would go to him quietly then. So that this is no correct. Oh, see, oh, see, oh, see, oh, see, oh. So one evening, we were, we were having problems with the internet connection and all that. That time we used to have socket work and one other. Not too sure now. So, myself, Professor Yuka, Timowo, uh, uh, a few of us were about seven, went to him and told him, say, Oga, this is the spoil of my hand. Ah, he cherished that message. And Paul is then chief of staff, by Istanbul, say, come, come, come. Uh, please take down your names. We didn't even know what was happening. <laughs> we took down our names, and before we knew it, we became members of what is now called PU. <laughs> the post ULE exam. He started the pure exam that brought sanity to the university. Uh, we thank you for that. <laughs> Even when the federal government is trying so hard to discredit that program. And I became known to a pure family, uh, Professor Wenzel. I can go on and on. But this evening is not uh, for speech making. I thank you so much. You have made so much impact. Thank you. <laughs> the Department of Biochemistry has been blessed with many vice chancellors. Now, there's a professor, a unique professor of ours, late Professor A.U. Osagi. He became vice chancellor in the Canadian University. He was when he was head of the department in the department. That he called us one evening. We were doing research. He said, ah, Come, myself, Omori, and those two we are all professors now. Also, Bob became my dean. Uh, he handed over to you, madam. And uh, when we went to him, he said, Please let me have your CV. We already put a CV together and submitted it to Professor A. E. Osaki. The next day, when we came to work to resume research, we got an appointment later. That was how I became appointed in the University of Benin in 1990. I would like to thank. I'd like to thank Professor A.U. Osaki. Yes, he's no longer with us, but I know he'll be looking down and saying to himself, that is my son. Yeah. <laughs> when I started my research, I had the opportunity of meeting a then fine young man, still about the finest in the campus, or what is that now? <laughs> Professor, I then call his first name, Felix Okere. Okay. Then he used to come in, my biochemistry boy, come, come, come. Uh, all the chemicals that I used were provided by Professor Adamson and Professor Okemi. I cannot forget that in the hurry. Uh, before we started this lecture, Okemi came in and said, That's my father. I said, Ah, your father is here. Come and introduce me to him. And I had the pleasure of introducing Professor Okemi to my father. The family of Okemi and myself were grown close. He's a bundle of advice. Thank you so much, sir. Now, we have formed what we call the biochemistry family. In my biochemistry family, we have a lot of people I like to talk Because they have either collaborated in research or they have given one advice on the other. Uh, most of all, this is my special guy. <laughs> we got appointed the same period. I was teaching in Baptist High School. Myself and Maury were teaching in Baptist High School in. Uh, in Benin, 
most of all was somewhere and uh, most of the way you did that is <laughs> somewhere in the same room. Uh -huh, yes. Uh, so I'm not appointed the same thing, but uh, most of all, uh, most of all, accepted his appointment a little earlier than we did. Uh, sometime in February, I think. We came in March. I said I'm worried. Uh, well, the biochemistry family is a, is, a, is a unique one. When I joined the department, we had two camps. There was a the progressive camp, there was the conservative camp. The conservative camp was led by Professor E. E. Ogotuku. The progressive camp was led by Professor E.A.C. Wanzi. And Professor Osaki, before he started his studies into genetic engineering, he called us as his sons to say, they could have not joined any camp. <laughs> and we took him. But as students, you must like some people. You don't get as me. I, I know. I, I know in my class, some people say, George, I like you. Just like I like my people. My father, when I was uh, in the PhD program, gave me a Range Rover to drive it. And one time I was driving to school thinking I was, in fact, I was late to class and, and drove one time into the department. Just before I sat down, one professor with a fine briefcase came to me. Who is that young man who drove that blue vehicle? I put up my hand. He said, Have you got a driver's license? I he didn't wait for me to answer. Who gave me drivers for me? Who gave me permit to drive on campus? The persons were just, they kept coming. So I just stood still and waited until he finished. When he finished, and he wanted to leave, I said, sorry sir, can I say something? Angrily he turned and looked at me. What do you want to say? I said, I wanted to ask permission to be able to carry your briefcase. <laughs> And I carried the briefcase, took it to his office. If I entered his office, I was wiping my, my feet so vigorously over the mat. No, come in, come in, come in, my son, come in, my son. And I asked him, where can I place your briefcase? He placed it there, put it there. Just before I left, he said, young man, come, where did you train? I said, the lorry. He said, who is your head of the department there? I said, from so the two guys. He said, oh, yes, that's a man of discipline. No wonder, no wonder. You know? <laughs> It was full of ovation. I said, I wonder. I said, what happened? He said, you'll get law. <laughs> Supposing that my person, you did not go. <laughs> now, I had many other unique teachers. When we were demonstrating in school, that time as master students, you come and supervise undergraduate students. Just as we are supervising them, they are also supervising us. And there was this professor. One of very deep tone, a Professor Campbell. <laughs> then Professor Campbell got the hot. Look at now. You know, you don't fool them. There was one time we were in class demonstrating. And the next thing we heard, if you talk again, I will slap you. <laughs> and what we told, here is this giant looking man looking to a small fry. And then you don't come over there. <laughs> anyway, Professor Campbell, thank you so much. Because after Professor, uh, Dr. George left back for India, Professor Campbell took over his formation of my master's program. Thank you. We have other teachers. We have other teachers. A lot of them have since relocated. But I am grateful to them. I'm grateful to them, truly. Because the things they talk to me and the kind of discipline they instill in me continue to guide me in life. I want to thank them. But I also have seniors that didn't teach. I didn't have the opportunity of being in their class. We have people like Professor Wadia, Professor B, uh, Professor. In fact, Professor Oroeke has a very good story to tell. I look forward to his inaugural lecture. Because, now you show me Guy Wei. 
In fact, the places and to visit to Miliki, I carry me home. Professor Solo Honigo also was nominated alongside me. And he, he 
stood down for me. Okay. I'm very grateful. Thank you for your question. You. you have Professor Adonai Fo, Pale.com, Professor Sawaro, <laughs> Professor Mike from Australia, Professor Fred Kaiser, Professor Kaka, Professor Evi Okeriwe, Dr. Yamu, Dr. Rafa Kalawa, Professor Alex Imogene, uh, Dr. Dribogo, Professor Kanisa Asonye, Professor Ofori, and our father, the father of us, in that faculty, who takes everybody as his son or daughter, Professor Igafuna. Thank you so much. Uh, let me report that your wife, Professor Igafuna, the director of the part-time studies, is making my stay in the camera very warm. I thank that family so much. Thank you. Now, there are two members of this university that are not members of our faculty, but I consider them to be. Uh, Professor Ogba Emmanuel Ogujo, the limit, there's a big limit. The settlement person. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, he's been appointed rector of the Delta State University, Utebi. I consider you as a member of our faculty. Thank you so much. There's also Buffy area. I thank you so much. Uh, it's a bumper. <laughs> it's currently on sabbatical. <laughs> now we have a special group that was put up by the ones that we call ourselves the reflectors. We have a head, and that head we call it the leader. Uh, Professor Okolocha, Chike Okolocha is our leader. The leader, thank you so much. Uh, the scribe of that group is Dr. Barista Ogoro. We call him the grandpa. He's the custodian of the constitution. Only him has seen the constitution. <laughs> but even our leader has a copy. <laughs> when he wants to win an argument in our debate, say according to section one, two of the constitution, which constitution? <laughs> Thank you for appointing or for announcing Professor Adeku to his professorship. He is a brother. I was able to congratulate him. There's a special friend of mine. I call him a close confidant. I call him my brother. I call him my friend. Because indeed he is. He made a past Deputy Vice Chancellor at me, Professor Lawrence. Federal. Uh, thank you so much for your friendship. I cherish it a lot. There's the uh, head of club, Professor Ediera. He's <laughs> <laughs> proponent of XD's extract. Yes. Because he has been X of everything, <laughs> including X acting vice chancellor. <laughs> He is the orator of the university, and uh, the normal slogan is "No condition is permanent." Yes. I have a special room in Professor in this house. Uh, that's the story for another day. But I'm not scared. <laughs> you know, when before Professor should have moved us into campus, anytime we are closing late and I cannot go home, it's his house I stay. And the wife knows, once I come, there must be a bank. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, now, this is the biggest family of all that I have. The family of our senior staff club. Yeah. Our therapeutic center. <laughs> when we go to Hawaii, a lot of things can be said about the staff club, but certainly not one associated with the names I'm going to call. We have Professor Elaho, an emeritus professor, uh, who always teaches. He's a teacher indeed. Once you spend one minute with him, you would have learned something that you would not learn in a week. Thank you so much. Emeritus professor. We have Professor Ojogu, Professor Boka, Professor Bis Omozoa, our dean, 
postgraduate school, the head of the session, uh, the happiness session. Thank you, Professor Uyi Ekwe, Professor Aiweku, calling the chair, Professor J. Akerele, the dean of state, uh, dean of pharmacy, sorry. <laughs> Because I had mentioned Pogostik before. <laughs> I actually skipped his name. Professor Pogostik is, um, he came provost when we were running colleges. There was a college of health, uh, health sciences. And then we, by chemistry, used to be in that um, uh, college. We contested to become provost with Professor uh, Imani Mental Health. Yes. And when we went to him as young men, we said, Rose, there are no other problems here. See, you are going to win. And you will win with one vote. Because we have done the mathematics. And took the time. After election day, Provostic won with one vote. <laughs> and Provostic is the original owner of the title Kalala. So, the um, uh, episode. That name you are answering now was seconded. <laughs> now, Provostic is one of the best dressed lecturers I've met. He plays tennis very actively, but beats you way well. And he has a wifey drought, uh, Professor Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Emeritus Professor Elao, if you spent a moment with Provostic, you will learn a lot. You will learn a lot. Uh, thank you for your friendship. <laughs> when I was wondering for a second, was able to take me in and we did some studies together. I did not capture them in this lecture. But they are there in my city. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now, we have other past presidents of the staff club. Or several projects, very small. The current dean, uh, the current chairman, Sam. Uh, thank you for your friendship. <laughs> Professor Ike, Sam. Masindi. Uh, Dr. C. Utame, my, my friend. Ben Yozo, the current president of the club. We call him the Big Ben. I don't know where he's speaking, but uh, he's going to be there. There's Dr. Ishikwe, who you call the master. Oh, master. Oh, master. Thank you for your friendship. Professor of bad blood, or good blood, depending on the way you look at it. <laughs> Professor Edna Selassie. He says to you, if your blood is good, I'll be out of work. So he's praying that your blood, will, your blood will be bad, so that you can come to the hospital and you'll clean them up. <laughs> Professor, good luck. Thank you so much. Now, we have Professor Charles in Mary Gay, the professor of sleep. I told him that if you put me to sleep, please, you must wake me. <laughs> and he guarantees you one thing, that I can put you to sleep, certainly. But I cannot guarantee you whether you will wake up. <laughs> the real deal, Professor Oke. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for reading. Professor of Fire, F I F N. You say the day lost without fire is lost forever. <laughs> Professor Mache, Professor Yuka, Professor Ifidon, Dr. Amechina, the Kunaka. <laughs> Thank you, Kuku. The Father K, uh, Professor K. Omoibo, the current head of the Department of Sociology, uh, Dr. Asekano, current head of the Department of Philosophy, uh, who we call Episode. Uh, Madam, if you hear us call it Episode, uh, we some inquiries. <laughs> we have Father K, uh, K. Okoro, Lala. Edo Bakari will call the director, Ai Boka, the Minister of Employment, and Rimeko, the Vice President, 
Mr. Z, can you call that? My special friend. I can go on and on, but that's not my staff club family. So when we leave here, please, the students, the ERO is going to announce to you. The students will be treated here. We will prove here. But my friends will accompany me to the staff club. Let us go and unwind. <laughs> now, I was able to join the UAV family. It was in the UAV family when Professor John, the courier, appointed me as representative to that board. That was when I met my friend, my vice chancellor, Professor Edward Bo Owesi. I was uh, I was admissions officer for science, he was admissions officer for engineering. And it was through him I met Madame. And since I met Madame, our friendship is now stronger than our old friendship. It's just about our friendship now that from the side. <laughs> Professor Imai Ukwado, Dr. K. U. Elevare, Professor Babi Kole, uh, Professor Manuke, Professor Mori, the current chairman of UAB, uh, Dr. Aikion Barre, Professor Omobide Iliado. These are some of the members of my UAB family. and thank all of you for your friendship. I don't know the explanation of my name. <laughs> now we have the Pew family. In the Pew family, I remember that we had a chair, uh, Professor Mrs. M. Ahohai. Please accept my sympathy on the loss of your husband, who is our teacher, our father figure, our friend. May so rest in perfect peace. Mr. Fulani Pigo, Pastor Joseph Ahohai, Mrs. Ojomo, former active registrar, Mrs. Ofwani, uh, Louis Bao, Professor Alpaka, many others. I cherish your friendship. I come up people. I greet you now. My vice chancellor, vice chancellor, when you appointed me deputy vice chancellor of Ikewa, it was like going back home. Because that was where I grew up. Uh, my father's house is just behind uh, the campus. From the hostel, the main hostel in the campus, you say George. I may answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm very grateful, uh, very grateful to Chief Macaulay Omo Azubele, Deputy Registrar. Thank you so much. You made my settling down seamless, and I thank you. You have always assisted very, very warmly, and you have given me direction. Say, so, okay, don't want like this, don't like this. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to you. Uh, I'd like to thank. Uh, Professor Saiba, Professor Mokoye, Professor John Nogene, Professor Mokoye, Professor Nogene, Adjei, Marcel Ohaku, Egwale, Professor Sweet and Edith, Emily Kebe, Dr. Sam Kwebu, Eldra, all these pictures are only CSO. Eldra go on. He's a talented educator. Dan Koromeri, Mrs. Siriago, Mrs. Uwubu, uh, Kayoma, this is Kayoma, Joseph, and my one and only friend. Uh, when I say one and only, I don't know the only one, I just want to go for more quality. Thank you so much. There are many others in the DPCs and Deputy Registrar's office I would like to mention, but they are captured in the book. Thank you so much for your friendship. Now, I have a family called the Year 2000 family. We believe by the, by the year 2000, everything will be free. That time, it was always referring to the year 2000. Year 2000. I'd like to thank members of the year 2000 club. Uh, we have Mr. Delio Boro, Eroi Maswe, Charles Chukuma, Sir Frank Ogwazo, uh, the sire of the Catholic Church, uh, Chris Imanele, by his Patricia Obano, Uyo Sawe, Baby Edolo, Chivani uh, Mokwe, Chivata Dali, Uche Onita, Sam Muntem, and Pastor David Oguma, uh, General Mike, UWC, Richard, Major General Eddie Achegoba, Richard, Chris Ogu, and many others. I say thank you for the friendship and the support. My elite forum family, uh, we formed an honorable club of only graduates from universities or graduates from polytechnics. And they are some of my friends today. We go out picnicking and our families have grown together. I'd like to appreciate the family of Solomon Kirapata, Ogenero Emawaya, uh, our current president, Engineer Isaac Okapo, 
Patrick Akonene, James Clark, Richard Okoje, Chief Richard Okoje, Patrick Ogaza, I saw him earlier, DOB uh, Nikoro, DOB Koto Bob, <laughs> John Aruche, Ebron Clement, Chief Sima Nusero, Felix Epo, Davis Epero, I saw you a while ago, Winston Okopata, John Bull, the Kiro, many others. Uh, please for time. Eh? Okay, forgive me. Uh, my neighbors, uh, we live in the big quarters. And the, when we live, we call the GROA of senior staff club, of, of the senior staff uh, quarters. Uh, I have wonderful neighbors. I have some, Professor Hassan, where I came now, uh, Engineer Mohan Sawasage, uh, Mr. Momo, not the dean. Then there's the Professor M. Momo, the dean of medicine. Professor Mrs. Sevilla, who I think, I believe, I understand will be giving the next popular lecture. Um, Professor Pere, Professor Wadia, Professor Jidong, Professor Ogu, uh, Professor Ugu, Gabriel, Dr. Miyi, my family doctor. I said thank you so much for your friendship and cooperation. Now to Mrs. I'm indeed indebted to all my friends who are Mrs. I'm honored to have Otumba J. O. Ogunfua, Physical Master, <laughs> and members of the Physical Lord of Nigeria, and this is not going to Your friendship has brought so much joy to my family, as I recall the wonderful role you played during my father's 80th birthday. You've actually brought all the messages in Nigeria to me, and that's everyone. I also thank you uh, for bringing quite a considerable number of messages with you to grace this occasion. Thank you so much. I wish you all very well. Now, my little family, uh, Papa, uh, I thank you for your help. <laughs> you had no other choice because what you did to me, you have done to all your other children. <laughs> but I was supposed to school abroad. Papa carried me to London. I had the misfortune of sitting with my principal, called Fred Daniel Cashman, in the same plane that took us to London. And we were sitting in the same uh, uh, same room. He, was, he sat next to me. I couldn't, I was speechless. That was that somebody, a reverend father, was covering the whole of that area. I recall that when we were in school, Andre Rabo is here, we were attached to this. Father was riding on ground or uh, orange colored beetle. Father left school. Ah, we said, Father, don't go for conversion. The school was rowdy. This was before seven. He came out from class, jumping, playing. Then the next thing we hear, we heard was, Father, they come, Father, they come. Ah, it's this speed. Everybody ran into classes. Any two ways you read, if not dictionary, read out. <laughs> if not Bible, read out. Newspaper, just a read. The man was so furious. Reverend Cashman had, we were so unfortunate, he entered my class. The next thing we heard was, Who said, Father, they come, Father, they come? <laughs> We all kept quiet. This white man grew red, practically red. I said, who said, Father the God, Father the God? <laughs> when he gave a knock to the man who was sitting by the door, he immediately pointed to one Aloysius. <laughs> and he went, oh, Aloysius, you again, my office, and that's my office, two weeks, you are gone. <laughs> and he made us cut grass for two weeks. Those of us in that class, the Rabbi, the training that we had there from Cashman, I'm sure, have carried a lot of us who finished from Ososa um, uh, through school and carried us beyond. Anyway, when we arrived in London, Papa said to me that he wanted me to school in London. I said to him, after three days of stay there, there was no ever. <laughs> <laughs> it was only some kind of pudding, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't make it. And a lot of of what they call soup. But it's all foster, mushroom. No, no, no soup. You know? And so there was nothing to eat it with. I said, that's only the muscle. I knew if I stayed back in London, I would not survive. So I told him, I said, Papa, I beg you, uh, make a following come back to Nigeria. That was how I ended up schooling in Nigeria.
I can go on and on. Thank you. I cannot be thankful enough. I had a wonderful brother who, until her death, my father did not know her quality. Because my mother had the pleasure of telling my father, since you they go out well well. So this religion one and then the talks are religion. This guy. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 